Akofi Kristala Institute of Theology, Mission and Culture, ACI, is a postgraduate research and training institution that focuses on African Christianity. It was founded in 1987 by Professor Kwame Beriako, who, with others, recognized the shift in the center of gravity of Christianity from Europe and North America to the southern continents, Africa, Latin America, Asia, and the South Pacific. Whereas at the beginning of the 20th century, about 80% of Christians lived in the West, now less than 40% live there, with the 60% and more living in the southern continents. This demographic fact places tremendous responsibility upon the church in Africa and makes African Christianity a field for active study and research so as to equip for more effective mission and ministry. Akrofi Kristala Institute exists to help the church rise to its responsibilities and meet the challenge. To achieve its objectives, ACI has developed the Master of Arts in Theology and Mission with a number of possible options Biblical Studies, Pentecostal Studies, Holistic Mission and Development, Leadership, Mother Tongue Theology, and Bible and Science. ACI also offers the Master of Theology program with options in African Christianity and Bible translation and interpretation. Then the Doctor of Philosophy program in Theology focuses on African and World Christianity and Bible translation and interpretation. Christian leadership in Africa and beyond will greatly benefit from the curriculum that enables those eager to equip themselves for mission and ministry to appreciate the realities of the African cultural and religious setting, as well as African Christian experience, and consequently engage more effectively with today's ministry challenges. To support the achievement of these laudable objectives, the Johannes Zimmerman Library is available for the use of students and visiting researchers. It houses about 30,000 volumes of literature and journals specializing in theology and the history of Christianity in Africa. It includes indigenous language materials as well as other special collections in African history, language, and culture. The Johannes Zimmerman Library also has an archive preserving archival materials of the Basel Mission and the Presbyterian Church of Ghana, as well as other ancient records of Christian history in Ghana. In addition, ACI is a subscriber to several databases which enable researchers to be truly international in their range of research. The offices and seminar rooms of ACI are housed in the historic Basel House, originally constructed between 1848 and 1860 to accommodate students who were trained to become teacher catechists of the Basel Mission Church and later the Presbyterian Church. Just adjacent to Basel House is the newest student's hostel which has spacious and comfortable accommodation for the many students who prefer to be housed on campus to give undivided attention to their studies. For guests and senior visitors to ACI, the historic Coconut House, also constructed in the 19th century, is available. Adjacent to Coconut House is the cafeteria, which offers full board in a deliciously delightful way. As demonstrated in the early African University, the Museum of Alexandria, Eating and theology form a very fruitful pair. Akrofi Kristaller Institute is situated in Akropong Akwapim, about 50 kilometers from Accra. But the town itself is historic, being the seat of the Akwapim Paramount Sea and is known for its annual Odura Festival, which continues the heritage of Akwapim religion and culture. Interestingly, ACI students observe this festival with a view to understanding how the religious and cultural aspirations it embodies may be turned to Christ. One of the core values of ACI is excellence, and it seeks to achieve this in all aspects of its life. It is no wonder that it was the first private theological institution to receive a presidential charter to award its own degrees. Again, it is the only theological institution in Ghana to graduate a substantial number of PhDs from across the African continent and beyond who are now members of its alumni association. Indeed, ACI is an international institution with faculty from three continents and it attracts students from across Africa and around the world, making its community truly international. 
Come visit us sometime, or better still, join us on campus for an exciting journey into theology and mission studies, all aimed at making the Church of Christ more effective in its ministry. started and I invite Reverend Michael Naughty, a research fellow of the Akrofi Priscilla Institute of Theology, Mission and Culture, to offer the opening prayer. Please let us pray. Dear Lord and Father of all humanity, we are grateful for your love, your mercies, and faithfulness towards us. We thank you, Father, for enabling the Akrofi Crystal Institute of Theology, Mission and Culture, and the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences to collaborate and bring to your people the 17th Asante Opoku Rhine of Lecture. We are grateful, Lord, that because of your faithfulness towards us, you have enabled us to gather from far and near for this special occasion. We pray, Lord, and bring before you our chairperson for the occasion, our speaker, and all other functionaries. We ask, O Lord, that you will guide them and use them as it pleases you to be a blessing to us this evening. We commit all of us as participants into your hands. That Lord, as we reflect on the lives and legacies of Asante, Opoku, and Rhinoff, our lives and mission, O Lord, will be inspired and will be effective in doing your will and all that you've called us to do here on earth. May you be with us throughout this lecture and may you bless our time together. We thank you for hearing us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Reverend Naughty. Ladies and gentlemen, 
It's a pleasure for me to warmly welcome you to the 17th Asante Opoku Randolph Lecture. This is a lecture under the auspices of the Akrofi Pistola Institute of Theology, Mission and Culture and the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences. We are grateful to God that he has brought us to the 17th in the series and we are gathered tonight to hear another presenter share with us thoughts on the three gentlemen that we honor with this lecture series. David Asante, Teoprosopoku, Paul Randolph. These were giants in their time workers of the Basel mission, local people who nevertheless felt they could contribute to the life and work of the Basel mission church. And when given the opportunity, they distinguished themselves. They distinguished themselves in the area of ministry, but in many other areas as well. And there are many writings and records of their activities and bear testimony to the decision to honor them with this series. We are grateful to the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences for the readiness to collaborate in this lecture series and to give us the opportunity to meet at the academy premises. We warmly welcome all of you to this year's lecture. Our prayer is that it will be a blessing to all of us. You are most warmly welcome. Now, I will proceed to introduce the one who will chair in this year's lecture. We've been privileged to have him chair the previous ones in recent years, and he is highly qualified to chair this year's lecture as well. Professor Dr. Engineer Henry Nia G. Wellington is a heritage scholar and a fellow of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences. He holds membership in many societies, is a fellow of the Ghana Institute of Architects, a member of the Ghana Institute of Planning, a member of the Ghana Heritage Conservation Trust, a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Administration and Management Consultants, and he's also a member of the Board of Trustees of the Christian Service University College based in Kumasi. Professor Wallington is a staunch member of the Presbyterian Church of Ghana and has been very active as a Christian and it's a privilege to have him chair this year's Asante Opoku Randolph Lecture, having himself been the presenter in the year 2018 on the topic, Edikanfumo, and what are heroes for? He belongs to the Opoku family, and therefore it's a pleasure for him to always be associated with this lecture series. On that note, I present to you our chairman for the occasion, Professor Dr. Engineer. And I do well into. 
So. Good evening, distinguished audience and those on online. Thank you very much, Professor Rector, for the introduction. Yes, I come myself as highly privileged uh, to be associated with this Asante Opoku Randolph series of lectures. I count myself as privileged because uh, in addition to being a fellow of the Academy of Arts and Sciences, as you've already been told, I have a direct relationship with the Opoku in the three, among the three giants. Opoku happened to be my great-great-grandfather. He was the grandfather of my mother. And my mother told me so much about him because my mother lived with the grandfather uh, up to the age of 15 when the grandfather passed away. In fact, she was there with the grandfather on their way from down the valley up to the hill of Akrepong when her grandfather passed away. So this series of great significance for me. So once again, I'm very grateful to the Academy for uh, asking me to chair this evening's lecture. Distinguished audience, it's a great delight for me to introduce the speaker for this evening. I just got to know him a few days ago when I was uh, with him on a Zoom. But I have here his uh, CV, from which I'm going to pick a few things to say about him. Our distinguished speaker for this evening is Reverend Dr. James Kweku Gechi Walton. And I would like to say that he's currently the Dean of Students and the Chaplain and the Senior Research Fellow at the Akrofi Krishna Institute of Theology, Mission, and Culture at the Kupun Equipment. I find him to be a very uh, interesting person because of his uh, work and his training. And I like to say that it is worthy of note that he's not only academic person, but also a clergyman is directly involved in the Methodist Church of Ghana as an ordained minister. And in addition to uh, his ministerial duties, he's been involved very actively in the work of the uh, Institute. Now, I'd like to say some few things about his education. He had his first uh, degree at the University of Ghana in psychology and mathematics in 1975, which I consider to be a very interesting beginning to have traced such a trajectory into uh, theology. He went further on uh, to uh, do uh, a postgraduate work uh, at the University of Cape Coast uh, in education. And then later on, he went on to do Master of Div uh, Divinity at the Asbury Theological Seminary in Wilmore in uh, the USA. Now, he has been very, very assiduous in his work as a scholar. And because of that, he's done a number of publications. Going through his CV, a few of them have attracted my attention, which I want to share with you, audience, this evening. Reverend Dr. James Kweku Walton has done a number of publications, including 
the publication on migration and the church in Africa, facing up to a contemporary challenge in Christian mission. It was published in 2021. He did this in conjunction with uh, Dr. Reverend Professor uh, Pobi, and Reverend Professor uh, K. Asante, they were the editors. Reverend James Keku Walton has also published uh, an article in the Golden Port, as a title, The Golden Port is Religious, Socioeconomic, and Political Impact on the Gold Coast and Ghana. This was in a publication edited by Robert, Professor Robert Edufenin and Professor Alison Howell. In addition to that, what attracted my attention was his publication on Trinity, in the Trinity Journal of Church and Theology on the article, Spirituality and the Primal Apprehension of the Christian Faith, a critical examination of Afua Kumar's Jesus of the Deep Forest. What also attracted my attention amongst his publications uh, is the a journal article uh, in the book on Thomas C. Auden, John Wesley's teachings. I find this to be interesting because it has to do with a person I've just discovered in my research on African, Asian African Christianity. In addition to this interesting journal publication, Reverend Dr. James Kweku Walton has done some additional academic papers as listed here. I'm not going to refer to them, but I want to go on to his research interests, which have also attracted my attention. I noticed that he's been involved in the Pan-African Toluca Roundtable uh, Conference on exploring child witchcraft accusations in African Pentecostalism, which I found to be very interesting. In addition, I've also noticed that he has uh, made a publication or uh, given a paper in the ACI annual doctoral seminar on the Bible in conversation with science and technology, technological ramifications from an African perspective. He has also taken part in a number of academic uh, workshops at the ACI and is given a few number of papers in that uh, workshop, amongst which I want to single out his presentation on writing African history, which I find to be very interesting indeed, because it's associated with a great man of theology uh, I discovered in my research, uh, the late Professor Andrew Walls. Finally, our speaker for this evening's presentation has also come up with a, a publication on Mythological Society of Ghana, Rethinking the Great Commission Emerging African Perspectives, which for me, as a Christian interested in evangelism, is very important indeed. Distinguished audience, here present and online, we are expecting a great deliverance from Reverend Professor, Reverend Dr. Uh, Walton this evening, because he's going to speak on miracles and works of power, substance and being of African Christianity. 
So, distinguished audience, Mr. Speaker, may I ask you to come and make your delivery. Thank you very much for coming. Prof. Chairman, Director of Akofi Chrysler Institute of Theology, Mission and Culture, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor for me to be asked to deliver the 17th Asante Opoku Randolph Lecture on the theme, Miracles and Works of Power, Substance and Bane of African Christianity. Prof. Chairman, the three gentlemen whom we celebrate today were all distinguished Christian leaders, as you have reiterated in your introduction. Indeed, they were clergy persons of high rank who served in the Basel mission of the 19th century. Their ministry saw them engaging with society in different ways but they all acknowledge themselves as serving God through Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. In this regard, they serve as early Christian leaders of African Christianity with the Gold Coast, now Ghana, as their sphere of service. All the three, Reverends David Asante, Theophilus Opoku and Carl Christian Randolph, were early ordained by the Basel Mission into full-time ministry. They served as pastors and evangelists, but they also became linguists, writing several monographs in their mother tongues to aid the pursuit of their calling. Randolph's production in 1895 of The History of the Gold Coast and Asante needs special mention. This was actually the English translation of the original in his mother tongue, Ga, in 1889. Sorry. Their literary and historical work served the society and nation they belonged to. Contemporary Christians sometimes erroneously think that the forebears of old, especially those of the historic mission category, were not as committed not as zealous, and to use modern parlance, not as ujacious, or not as spirit-filled. The conversion story of Asante, for example, should help to dispel such wrong thinking. So on Asante's conversion, having been exposed to the gospel for a while, Asante felt that he did not measure up to the standards of God for baptism. It was one stanza of Sanke him 130, that convinced him that it is sinners that Jesus came to call, not the righteous. And let me quote the hymn, the stanza in reference. Come ye sinners, poor and needy, weak and wounded, sick and sore. Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pity, love and power. He is able, he is willing, doubt no more. The words of the hymn encouraged Asante to surrender to that pity, love, and power of God, and so was converted and eventually offered for full-time ministry. Our early Christian forebears were people who had committed themselves to a cause who set them at variance with the accepted standards of society. And one needs to espouse a deep love for God to be able to do so. No wonder they were used of God to greatly grow the early Basel Mission Church and others. Having cleared the issue of their Christian commitment, one may be surprised not to find practices that contemporary Christians consider as reflection of powerful, miraculous ministry in their lives, except for one or two reports of the general period. Note that these were people who had marks of evangelical ministry with several open-air preaching activities, vibrant prayer meetings, active study of the word, and missionary trips. Of these one or two reports, Catechist Edward Amedi Samson of Latte Church, who prayed for a dead boy to come to life on 29 December 1859, may be mentioned. 
Later, after May 1866, in the face of a drought which was blamed on the church and school roof, which had been done with shingles as against the traditional touch, Reverend David Asante and the same church prayed and rain fell from 11 p.m. to the following day, 5 a.m. Additionally, interviews by Adam Moore in a research endeavor indicates a past of healing activities through prayer, but not many found their way into annual reports and other documents. One may wonder why the death of such reports. This is made even worse by the fact that the missionaries who carried the message about Christ came from a background which included healing and deliverance activities similar to what is practiced in Ghana in deliverance sessions. In their home, one may readily mention Reverend Christian G. Blumhardt and his more renowned nephew, Reverend Joan C. Blumhardt, who represent a wide range practice of healing through exorcist deliverance within Southwest Germany, but with concentration in Württemberg partisan. They did not promote Christian exorcist practices, even though they healed through preaching and prayer as part of their mission work. But back home, the popular religious beliefs of early 19th century Germans included primal or basal spiritual elements, such as we find in Ghana, that is the presence of spirits in the world, some vile who affect humans for evil. That missionaries in Ghana did not actively promote practices purported as a response to primal religious understandings has been largely relegated to aspects of the European enlightenment, which questioned the supernatural. Indeed, from the 1750s onwards, rational thinkers strongly opposed the idea of the world of spirits, which included Satan as a personal spiritual being. Many began to accept the position of Friedrich Slimatia, which saw evil as an abstract force. Spirits and demons were culturally created, they thought, and these were images that attempted to personify this abstract entity. But this was also the earlier worldview of the Christian world and of Europe. Indeed, even from the Christian church fathers through to the medieval times, a primal worldview had been in existence with beliefs in spirits who could influence human life for good or evil. Satan was the head of the evil spirits and operated using his subordinate demons. Even Martin Luther, progenitor of the Reformation, as well as other reformists, accepted a primal worldview and also promoted witch hunting. This was a worldview of popular religion as well. Now, with the gradual spread of Enlightenment thought and theology, there naturally arose two opposing groups, those in favor of Enlightenment theology and those who stood for traditional Christian views. This traditional position reflected the general primal worldview which existed in most of the populace. The Enlightenment group would gradually grow to submerge the traditionalists, especially with the onset of the bacteriological revolution. Basel missionaries, however, were often strong conservative Christians in their views. That they would not promote miraculous healing and deliverance is an open question. Was it because they did not see themselves as having the gifts for it? Or was it because of the general attitude of the church back at home? For in Germany, the Lutheran church as a whole condemned primal religion and frowned upon Christian involvement with it. But the popular worldview was so primal that persons like the Blumhards engaged with it theologically and established healing and deliverance ministries with success, as cited earlier. But the general church did not do too much about exhaustive activities. They still maintained a primal worldview, but held back from an active deliverance theology and practice, largely because Protestant theology had begun to limit 
the intervention of the supernatural in the natural or material world, they had begun to move in the way of the Enlightenment. On the mission field, the attitude was maintained that they had come to liberate poor and enslaved Africans from spiritual darkness and demonic captivity and transfer them to the kingdom of light. They would condemn practices that appeared to uphold the evil of primal religion, but not engage in exorcist activities, nor even deliver ministry which showed sensitivity to the primal worldview. But one may ask, like deliverance ministers back home, they could have helped those believed to be afflicted by evil powers through such activities and thus showcase the power of Christ. Well, they did not, and we are not fully sure why. Possibly it was because of the general attitude of the church back home in Germany as surmised earlier. But perhaps we should ask the same question of the average historic mission minister 20 years back who was caught between and betwixt official church policy and the primal worldview of the people. Missionaries, though, still had a general primal worldview, so it appears they followed initially their primal instincts by accepting Akan therapeutics when they were sick, but officially denounced generally Akan religion in favor of Christianity. This does not mean that the missionaries and even local pastors did not emphasize the power of God to assist the Christian believer in his existential challenges as has already been observed. It appears our three gentlemen, Asante, Opoku, Randolph, those we honor today fall into this category. Now, as the years went by, the bacteriological revolution and the spread of enlightenment thought stifled even more any attitudes of missionaries towards the practice of works of power in exorcism. Naturally, this would affect the total effectiveness of their general ministry to the African, whose worldview was strongly primal. We've been focusing on the Basel mission, but equally, the same observations may be made about other missionaries that grew the early Christian church in Ghana, the Wesleyan Methodist Missionary Society being one of the earliest. Kwame Bediakon has noted that even though missionary education, especially in its vernacular forms, had a theological objective, that is to enhance the Christian endeavor, it turned out to raise a scholarly clientele who were at home with the local, but also open to the perspectives of the global. One may observe that in the same way, miracles and works of power, even though not emphasized, but possibly practice on the quiet and helping to bring people to faith, led to an appreciation of the vitality and the possibilities of Christian education from a local perspective, for the local gods were deities of power. One may ask them, what is the relationship between works of power and Christian ministry? Are works of power needful for effective Christian ministry? The purpose of this lecture is to discuss such works of power in African Christianity. Some see them as the main thrust of Christian ministry, while others see them as appearing to cast a slur upon the authenticity of the Christian faith. Together, they appear as a paradox, hence our topic. So let's turn our attention to works of power in Christian ministry. The question as to whether works of power are needful for effective Christian ministry may be seen by some as only rhetorical, since primary religion as well as experience points to it. However, because Jesus, the founder of Christianity, has some strong words against people who were following him merely because of works of power, one needs to reflect on it. Jesus had said, and I quote him from John's Gospel, chapter 6, verses 26 and 27. Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loops and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, 
which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. The signs that Jesus spoke about forms a good portion of the writing of the Gospel of John. John chose a few miracles of Jesus and posited them as signs, works of power which pointed to him as a Messiah, the chosen of God, to get people to accept him as their life's leader and guide. So at the close of his book in John 20, 31 and 32, he summarizes, and I quote him, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written, that you may believe that Jesus is a Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name, unquote. John's objective then was for his readers to go beyond the ordinary spectacular performance of the signs and see them as pointing to Jesus as worthy of faith or life commitment, which belief in him as a Messiah, Son of God, entails. For John then, miracles were a pointer to the person of Jesus as a Messiah, the Savior of the world. But this is not how many others saw it. The signs of miracles meant that Jesus could be a wonderful leader to minister to their felt needs. So Jesus was performing miracles, but his objective was different from that of the general populace. Hence his earlier frustration in John 4, 48, and I quote him again, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will never believe, unquote. He was telling the royal official who had come to him for the healing of his son because he realized that he was attempting to relate to him only as a miracle worker or healer, a spiritually powerful man that one could approach in times of need. A sign or work of miracle does is to produce faith in Jesus as the Son of God. It may result, however, in unintended negativisms. Some would accept them so they would be used for their own selfishness, and even others would reject them altogether, closing their eyes to what they point to, such as happened when Jesus was branded as working as a collaborator with Beelzebub, the prince of demons, when he had healed a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute. And this is in Matthew chapter 12, verses 22 to 32. They are not always, therefore, reliable as generators of faith in Jesus, that is, works of power. If this is the case, why then did Jesus accompany them in his ministry? Gleaning through the Gospels, one can see a wider objective culminating in that set forth by John. Among them, we may identify firstly, the miracles or works of power were performed by Jesus as a response of love to human need. As for example, when Jesus met the funeral procession of the widow whose only son had died. This meant that the widow had become extremely vulnerable with no one to care for her. Jesus, in compassion, raised him from death out of love. Secondly, the miracles were to validate the authenticity of his ministry as backed by divine authority. This is a popular belief. It is also held by primal religion. It is only natural to expect that supernatural activity points to the supernatural source of a person's power. Jesus' miracles were, however, above any normal works of power. Aside from the several healing miracles, the feeding of the 5,000 and the raising of the dead may be mentioned. These made him out as a personage whose claims were worth exploring. Thirdly, and following from these two um, reasons already identified, one may note that Jesus' works of power were to get the attention of people, attracting them to believe in him and consequently to gain true life as John insisted. Many from all walks of life thus benefited from his show of power, ranging from Nicodemus, the religious leader, 
who upon reflection went to Jesus at night, and the centurion who saw him die, to Thomas the disciple who would not initially believe in the resurrection, or would eventually declare like Thomas, my Lord and my God. Works of power in Jesus' military thus had a varying objective, but they were all gradually to lead the individual to faith in Jesus. The Christian minister may thus learn from their master. However, in Africa, and generally among primal societies, an issue comes up which we shall pursue next, as we consider miracles and works of power as substance of African Christianity. Kilian Bediakon has shown that, and I quote her, persons from a primal background are the ones who embrace the Christian gospel the most readily, who find that on entering the Bible, they do not have far to go before they find themselves on familiar ground, and whose God, hallowed from ancient times, is now revealed in the translator scriptures to be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, unquote. The scholarship thus indicates the primal substructure of Christianity. In other words, persons from a primal background are more likely to embrace the Christian gospel, which is indeed what has happened. Primal religions have been found to underlie the Christian identity of most Christians in all of Christian history. They are consequently the most fertile ground for Christian adhesion. But what is primal? For those of us who are not so familiar with the term, which I have used severally in this lecture earlier, one may take the definition of Harold Turner as almost standard. And I quote him, the most basic or fundamental religious forms in the overall religious history of mankind. They have preceded and contributed to the other great religious systems. They are both primary and prior, and they represent a common religious heritage of humanity. One may think of primal as traditional, but even traditions change. So a better way is to look at them as basic religious forms, as Turner has tried to explain. Turner went on to outline six features of primal religions. For our purposes in this lecture, we shall look at the third, fourth, and sixth features. The third feature concerns the realization that there is a spiritual dimension to this world. A spiritual world of powers of beings more powerful and ultimate than humankind. It is these powers of the transcendent who are the ultimate cause of events in the universe, including serious sickness. One should therefore always ask, who caused this, not what caused this? These personalized powers of the transcendent, however, are ambivalent. There is a hierarchy of benevolent ancestors and of spirits, divinities and high gods, but also the range of evil spirits, of demons and malevolent divinities, and the lesser, more earthborn occult powers of wizards and witches. This, then, is the source of the observed belief in mystical causality by people from a primal background. Closely related to the third feature, the fourth feature denotes the belief that humankind can enter a relationship with the benevolent world of the transcendent for their good. Blessings and protection may be received thereby. It is from the transcendent that fulfillment in life comes. To attain this true life, religious specialists direct humans through special rituals, sacrifices, and customs. In contemporary times, the Christian equivalent becomes the rise of the charismatic or prophetic specialist endued with supernatural power to effect interventions. A special ability in healing, protection, and prosperity results from his position, and it is snatched from evil powers who intend harm for the client. This is feature concerns a unified view of the cosmos 
encompassing both physical and spiritual beings. There's a fine line between the physical and the spiritual. Hence, the physical may be used under special circumstances to serve as sacrament or an avenue to access the spiritual and supernatural. With this understanding of religion in the primal worldview, clearly any religion that is likely to capture the imagination and adhesion of a majority of people would have to issue forth as power. A few people may be attracted to intellectualism, but the majority are more likely to move towards that which seems to exude power for existential well-being. Kwame Bidiaku's observation is true, and I quote him, Primal religions generally conceive of religion as a system of power and of living religiously as being in touch with the source and channels of power in the universe, unquote. For Christianity to attract the majority of people, therefore, it must show its credentials as power. Fortunately for it, it does not only operate with the primal worldview, but also as Paul has declared, and I quote Paul from Romans 1.16, the gospel is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, unquote. Christian leaders operating with this worldview are thus likely to emphasize Christianity as power to authenticate their brand of religion. Missionary transmission of Christianity to Africa presented the faith as a religion of the West. The West then was enjoying for their time an unprecedented rush of technological advancement which Africa at that time did not have. The ships representing the advances in transportation, the military technology, the demonstration of the capacity for production of goods in large quantities among others may be mentioned. The Africans saw the West as a source of power. Aside from the shortfalls of cultural inadequacy, as missionaries presented the gospel as the flip side of Western culture, there certainly will be some Africans who would give it a hearing and come to genuine faith, which is what happened. The promise of Western education as an avenue to the good things of the world aided the enterprise, and church ranks were filled with many who had been introduced to Christianity through their participation in mission school education promoted by colonial governments. In Ghana, by the mid-20th century, Christian expansion had achieved about 40% of the population, but it appeared it had plateaued. Historical observation would show that this was the result of the cultural inadequacy of the faith. Among others, it had rejected the primal worldview and declared the African as backward, depraved, and under the religious slavery of Satan. Naturally, it would be difficult for the average African to accept this. For even crisis situations, diagnosed as a result of mystical causality, among others, did not receive any help from missionary ministry as also a ministry generally insensitive to the primal world view. The shortfalls of missionary transmission, that is its cultural inadequacy in rejecting the primal world view of the African, was resolved through the rise of the African independent churches. Operating with this world view, the Christian faith was engaged and several ritualistic practices were evolved to deal with survival in an enchanted universe. Several scholars have discussed these churches and their practices, as well as their metamorphosis into Pentecostal, Christmatic, and New Prophetic churches. These scholars would include Christian Baita, Kingsley Labi, Sefas Omenyo, and J. Pabna Asamwajibu. The ministries had to be power-based for them to be useful and effective in the milieu. Using mainly Paul's reminder in Ephesians chapter 6 that the Christian is in spiritual warfare, focused activities on warfare prayers are engendered. Church vocabulary and practice 
show that they are in touch with the beliefs of the primal worldview. But being Christian, offer Christian interventions rather than primal ones. Barrenness, for example, may be explained as a result of witches removing the womb of the victim and even playing football with it. And Christian intervention relates to breaking their power through prayer or other interventionist practices to restore the womb back in place. In worship, large amounts of noise is generated to create the effect that some supernatural warfare is taking place. All this is led by the charismatic or prophetic expert who is supposed to be endued with the spiritual resources to help deliver victory through special prayers and rituals. Quoting Ephesians 6, 18, where Paul encourages and I quote him, all kinds of prayers, unquote. As Asamoah Jiru notes, and I quote him, enchanted words and the supply of a range of sacramental substances infused with supernatural power for dealing with anything from ill health to the search for and protection of health, leading to prosperity and well-being are used, unquote. They seem to have achieved their purpose. For even though they may not be able to deliver solutions, the efforts at enabling power from the transcendent to help people solve their problems generates large measures of hope. So they continue their commitment. Even for Western mission-founded churches, whose efforts at maintaining relevance has been observed as Pentecostalizing their practices, which in practice means being sensitive to the primal context in which they minister, the shift results in their being able to maintain a fair number of their numbers as well as attract new ones. Both their normal and revival services do indicate that they are sensitive to the worldview and traditional sources of transcendental power as well as the Christian responses which even though true in the past, was not so evident because of Western-oriented worship formats and practices. One non-clergy leader of such revival meetings in the past was heard to remark, and I quote him, we are the people doing the real work in this church, unquote, meaning the ordained minister was not in touch with power and consequently not as effective. This has been largely remedied in most places. All of this has seen to the rise in Christian attention to over 70% of the population in Ghana. In Africa as a whole, the numbers keep rising, making it the most populous Christian continent as similar developments may be observed. On these bases, one can observe that, overall, miracles and other works of power necessarily have become part of the substance or objective of African Christianity. Even though their presence may be scant in several congregations, there is a hope that since the God of miracles is in their midst, his work of power would be realized in due course by faith. People yearn for it, and they will probably recount several miracles in their personal lives as a mark of the presence of God with them. The emphasis is on power to meet felt needs, just as the traditional religious aspect and its cultures would do, as against perhaps in other jurisdictions of Christianity where the emphasis would be different. May we turn our attention at this point, therefore, to miracles and works of power as being of African Christianity. Despite the ability to attract adhesion, miracles and works of power used as a prime basis of Christian ministry have their gross shortfalls. The major shortfall relates to the objective of the founder of Christianity, which has been partly addressed above. One may ask, why Christianity? This relates to salvation history, in which one recognizes the break in the love fellowship of the Creator God with His created order, the result of sin. 
The arrival of Jesus on the scene is believed by Christians to be the incarnation of God to lead in the final effort at getting the lost fellowship restored. The death of Jesus on the cross is seen as a sacrifice that cemented a possible reconciliation because it dealt with the same problem. God's love could now win his people back. The main efforts of Jesus during his ministry were thus to get people to relate to him as their life leader, in Jewish terms as a Mezar, and in more general terms as their Lord and God who fulfills their life aspirations because he reconciles them to God. They should therefore be obedient to him in love. It is true, as demonstrated earlier, that because of his love, Jesus' ministry was also filled with compassionate works of power to deliver people from their existential challenges. So David Bosch has submitted that in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus' ministry is seen as holistic, involving both works of power and teaching to transform people to be holy, to begin to live the life of the kingdom of God. Indeed, Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost introduced Jesus as a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him. And of the early Christian preachers also, God testified to their ministries with signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by the gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his work. And I've quoted firstly from Acts chapter 2, verse 22, and Hebrews chapter 2, and verse 4. This does not mean that they did not preach for people to be committed to and live by the teaching of Jesus, but it shows that their ministry was attractive and holistic, ministering to all life concerns, both physical and spiritual. In Pentecostalism also, the miraculous is valued and affirmed, and worship is authentic encounter with God in his power and blessing. The promise of the Holy Spirit, which emphasizes, is associated with power. And in Acts 1.8, 1, 8, 1 reads, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Moreover, in the Pentecostal mindset, prayer, authority, and power go together. And re renewal groups have generally similarly valued miracles and works of power as an authentication of the presence and power of God. No wonder the brand of Christianity that is fueling the rapid Christian expansion in Africa is Pentecostal charismatic, since it meets the primal worldview expectations we see its religious practice as efforts in assessing power to achieve well-being. The emphasis on meeting felt needs, when not balanced, however, leads to a Christian practice that is divorced from the intended love fellowship of God. Now, it is geared only towards drawing power from God to solve problems. God now becomes an impersonal power source, and phrases such as moving the muscle of God, moving the hand of God, bending God's ear, are thus often used. The power of the ritual to effect results, be it prayer, blessed items such as bangle, ring, or car sticker, prophetic words, the anointing, and so on, is emphasized. And the ritual itself may become a fetish, as God now ceases to be a personal being seeking fellowship with his lost humanity. The desire of God in Christ in reconciling and establishing a relationship of love with the believer is lost. Important aspects of Christianity that may be summarized as discipleship or a life transformed into the likeness of Christ are also relegated to the background. So even potential church preachers taking licensing exams, consider it normal to cheat, possibly because the end justifies the means. One may ask, what would they preach if it must be to a group of students preparing to take examinations? 
For one may surmise that it is merely the power of God available to them to pass. And how will such preachers treat other issues of morality when it does not favor them? Does this not also speak to the observation that despite the large Christian adhesion in Africa, corruption is a problem? Further, the media is used heavily for the activities of such Christian leaders. On the radio and on TV, several programs featuring men of God and prophets prescribe all kinds of apanchre or spiritual directions to alleviate the challenges people go through. And additionally, invitations are given for counseling at their churches. To give an idea of the ongoings in these media communications in one radio program, listeners who needed luck and love were directed to prepare a concoction of soup, honey, and other ingredients to be used to wash their face, whilst praying to God for luck and love. It would bring suitors to women, success in interviews, and other fortunate happenings to the user. Here, traditional primal practice of preparing concoctions for spiritual empowerment has been made a Christian ritual for success. So the personal God can be coerced through apparent magical practice to act on behalf of a suppliant, one may ask. Indeed, for large portions of African Christianity, miracles and works of power are ends in themselves for existential needs to be met. As a Samuel Jedu notes, and I quote him, through prayer, power may be obtained for healing, deliverance, exorcism or defeating demons, overcoming enemies, gaining promotions in life, securing favors, living a victorious Christian life, building and growing a church, and even taking control of physical and spiritual spaces on food. Not that there is anything wrong in these Christian interventionist activities. It is when they become the existential reason for church practice that one is forced to question their relevance in comparison with the scriptural position. For some churches, the body of Christ, even become solely clinics which dispense solutions to problems. And on this, it is interesting to note that some new prophets have added an herbal therapeutic practice to their spiritual activities of dealing with the powers generating the misfortune. In this environment, the Christian leader comes under pressure to perform, sometimes to conjure miracles to satisfy the clientele. And reporter scandals in social media speak of Christian leaders approaching traditional religious aspects for power to amass miracles to meet the expectations of their following, even though the Christian faith frowns on this. The abuses are many. One can speak about the South African pastor who oversaw his congregation to chew grass and human hair ostensibly to achieve victorious delivery of their destinies. And there's also the prophetess that managed to take huge sums of money from a client to divert so-called adverse calamity coming on her family. And finally, the recent court case of Miss Patricia Sebia, also known as Nana Agrada, a traditional priest turned Christian pastor who allegedly promised to double monies of her, of her congregation but failed to deliver which is trending in national news and social media. All these show the dangers that unmitigated attempts at using supernatural power, in this case of God, to effect miracles may result in unfortunate events. It must be mentioned that scripture warns against the dangers of prophetic ministry, even though it may be also used as a pastoral tool. And I quote Jesus from Matthew 7, 15 and 16. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruits you shall know them, unquote. Aside from these abuses by Christian leaders, other inadequacies, more theological, 
may be leveled against the strand of Christianity that aims at assessing power for existential solutions for their own sakes. For lack of time, only one will be briefly considered. The cross has always been seen in Christian theology as the centrality of the faith, hence the symbol. African Christianity, in its efforts to deliver to the primal worldview of religion as well-being and success in a threatening world, fixes itself to the theology of glory and triumphalism of new Pentecostalism. In the process, the cross as the basis of a theology of suffering is successfully uprooted from Christian practice and thought. In the early stages of the movement, no Good Friday service was held. Emphasis was on the results of the Friday event, its victory and the consummation brought with the resurrection. The question as to why God did not answer Jesus' question, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That he did not answer it with a glorious descent from the cross. This is answered by saying, oh, it was for our present victory and glory. In the process, the suffering aspects of discipleship are carved out of the Christian life. And the suffering Christian is left to fight against the powers who are causing it. Meanwhile, it could be that God had allowed it to engender growth into maturity. Similar concerns may be raised about other issues which, as indicated, the exigencies of time will not allow us to pursue. But part of the problem that leads to this, Prof. Chairman, is a faulty interpretation of Mark's Gospel, chapter 16, verses 15 to 18, by some sections of the Christian faith. For purposes of clarity, I'll quote the relevant scripture. I'm quoting Mark. He said to them, and this is Jesus, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. Unquote. Now note that the signs or works of power constitute an accompanying feature to the preaching which is commanded first in verses 15 to 16. That's the earlier part. This is done before the sign element in verses 17 to 18, the latter part. Aside from the fact that preaching is placed before the works of power, the works are not presented as directly accompanying the preacher's ministries, but rather as belonging to the church as a whole, the body of Christ, which is indeed what has happened. Those signs indeed are found in the world's Christian body. Some Christians, however, interpret these verses as meaning that signs must necessarily accompany every Christian preacher or leader's ministry. In other words, normal Christian ministry must be characterized by glorious and victorious works of power. No apparent or weakness or defeat at all as we seen. This naturally puts stress on leaders when such signs are absent. The dynamism of their spirituality is in question. But their gifts may be another area, as a metaphor of the church as the body of Christ depicts. Christians have different gifts and roles to play in the church. So overall, the general African Christian emphasis on this worldly issues presents itself as part of the bane to its success in ministering to the human predicament in a world of sin and suffering. It is a one-sided emphasis that skews the teaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ 
to its disadvantage. So, Prof. Chairman, the way forward, what should we do to do right, one may ask. Permit me the indulgence to suggest briefly what could be done. The Christian leader should be clear in his or her mind what and why they are leading. If the result detail of the faith is clearly understood and accepted, the likelihood that issues relating to what we have identified as the bane of Christianity would arise would be low. The prime objective would be to follow the founder, the Lord Jesus Christ, in his efforts to make disciples of all nations of the world, and in the process to urge them to come to a personal acceptance and faith of his ability to live their lives in love. The primal worldview of any society serves as an advantage to Christian adhesion as Christian faith itself is primal in its understanding of the world, I may add, Prof. Chairman. It has been pointed out earlier that such societies are the most fertile in accepting the Christian faith. If, however, in its efforts to be relevant, there is no proper translation of Christian teaching into the tenets of primal worldview, the expansion of Christianity would be found to be shallow in its understanding of the Christian faith itself. Temptations then to engage in activities that will constitute a bane to the faith will be myriad. Translation here would be to find the true Christian equivalent or response to beliefs and practices that embody primal belief, using preferably the mother tongue because it leads to greater comprehension. Jesus has shown that ministry should be holistic with an underlying overriding objective of commitment to love him as Savior and Lord. The true Christian then would attempt to follow his or her Lord. Indeed, as the gospel impinges on the African world, it must grapple with the fact that people would tend to respond to it with the primal worldview of African eyes. What an African religious leader does it should be able to do in a greater way for it to be acceptable. One is led to focus thus on works of power, and so present Jesus as the acceptable religious leader par excellence of Christus Victus. The Christian leader, ministering in the African world, is consequently given a pattern of ministry which is more or less enshrined in works of power, it appears. One must note, however, that even though this is similar, Jesus' works of power had a greater objective than just to meet human need. They were signs, that is, windows in which one saw the reality of who he really was, and thus be led to establish a relationship of love with him. This tension must be kept by the Christian leader, similar to what Jesus himself had, since his was also a primal world with a primal worldview. And if one insists that some public display of works of power may be seen in the Christian leaders' ministry for it to be authentic and effective, one may point to celebrated prophet John the Baptist, who was not recorded as performing any work of power. The power or anointing behind the preaching or teaching ministry itself could be a pointer to the supernatural underpinnings of the ministry as can be illustrated in Ghanaian Christian history. Because of the understanding of the Christian church as a body with different roles, works of power need not be normative in the ministry of a Christian leader. Prof. Chairman, may I conclude? Miracles and works of power have their place in any religion that attempts to help adherents access or relate to the transcendent since this is the arena of the supernatural. Both Christianity and primal worldview see a thin line between the two realms. Consequently, the breaking in of transcendental phenomena in the physical world should necessarily result in supernatural activity. Jesus Christ, the founder of Christianity, used the supernatural in various ways as has been identified in this lecture. 
following him in his balance and objectives for African Christianity should be the way forward. If, on the other hand, influence from the primal worldview, among others, results in an overemphasis on words of power, then ministry will be seen as losing its way. Miracles and works of power in African Christianity could be both substance and being, depending on the balance that is put to them in the process. It has been noted by Andrew Walls and others that Africa has now become the center stage for the purposes of God in mission. If leadership is driven by counterfeits, then the future of world Christianity is bleak. Some leadership, however, may be genuine, but ignorant and lacking in insight in true translation in the primal worldview. Hence, the underlying purpose for our choice of lecture topic in this series. It is a call for more theological responses to the Christian ministry engagement with the primal worldview such that the integrity of the faith is upheld. Only such, I believe, will help clear the maze of personal interpretations of scripture, some of which do not help the Christian cause. God, it appears, has given the African church a task, and we cannot afford to fail him. Thank you, Prof. Chairman. Distinguished audience present and online, I would like you to once again join me to congratulate Reverend Dr. Walton for this brilliant presentation on the subject he was asked to speak on. Reverend Dr. Walton, thank you very much for this very fascinating presentation you made. I made extensive notes of what uh, you have talked to us uh, this evening. There's so much, so enriched, and so uh, profound that I will not be able to summarize. But I would like to just uh, comment on one or two points as a way of my response to what I've heard. I would like to, to commend you for putting a lot of emphasis on the scriptural basis of works of miracles and power uh, in the church in Africa. The need to let the word of God, the scriptures direct and influence and control uh, works of miracles and power in the church. Otherwise, it becomes a very big problem for the growth and development of the African church. I would also like to uh, commend you for emphasizing that when it comes to works of miracles and power in the church, the model of Jesus is what leaders, the church leaders, must follow, and nothing else. Finally, uh, I'd like to comment on the caution which you brought up very distinctly about the need for the African church to be cautious, not allow works of power and miracles to corrupt, as it were, the church, as we have it uh, here in Ghana today. So, Reverend Dr. Walton, thank you very much for this brilliant presentation. And on behalf of the Akrofi Christian Institute of Theology, Mission and Culture and the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences, I'd want to say thank you very much to Professor Wellington for chairing the occasion. Thank you very much, Prof. And thank you also to Reverend Dr. Walton for his presentation. As has been acknowledged, very fascinating and nevertheless uh, a warning to African Christian leaders in terms of their responsibility 
towards the future of global Christianity. Dr. Walton, thank you very much. And I have the pleasure of inviting Apostle Dr. Emmanuel Nim, Pro Vice Chancellor of the Pentecost University, to close us in prayer and give us the benediction tonight. Apostle Dr. Enim. Shall we bow in prayer? Our gracious Lord, we thank you for bringing us to this point. We thank you for the issues for reflection. We thank you for Dr. Walton and the important things that he's brought our attention to. We thank you for the gift of life in Christ and the contribution of African Christianity to global mission. Our attention has been brought to things that we need to think through, issues of engagement of uh, the faith and culture, the role of our mother tongue, and how we can reflect deeply in our faith and being faithful to scripture. Thank you for emerging trends, but also we are mindful of all the challenges and issues that sometimes are quite disturbing. We ask for your grace and we ask for your wisdom for your leaders who lead the churches, for the people that are called into the prophetic ministries. We pray that, Lord, you would help us to be conscious of the abuses. And we pray, O oh God, that you would help us to be able to raise a standard that would glorify your name. And that what African Christianity would bring to the table in global mission shall be desirable. Thank you for Kofi Cristela Institute and thank you for the vision and thank you for all those who have been contributing for this just cause. We ask that Lord, you continue to guide us by your spirit and strengthen us and Father also encourage us. We pray, O oh God, that your name will be glorified and the blessing will be upon this land and beyond. This is what we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.